You can't cheat the passage of time. You can't jump ahead and say, I'm going to figure out by being a smarter computer, so to speak, what's going to happen by being a smarter brain, whatever. I can figure out what's going to happen. That doesn't work. Stephen, how about, how about this quote from your fellow uh, countryman, Sir Arthur Eddington? He said, uh, in 1915, the year of Einstein's, you know, one of his miracle years, if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There is nothing for it to collapse in deepest humiliation. And yet you're right. Nobody had proven it, I think, by that point. Right. I mean, that it was so. No, no, no. Nobody, it, the, the stuff I've done recently is the closest we've got to kind of proving the second law of thermodynamics and understanding what its real origins are. Yes, I, I'm not, I was never very impressed with Eddington, I have to say. And uh, that was not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that quote. I mean, you know, in, in, in fact, in, the, in this book, one part of the book is devoted to my efforts to trace the history of the second law of thermodynamics, which I, I have to say, I was very surprised nobody had written a definitive history of the second law of thermodynamics. After I worked on it, I understood why they hadn't. It's really complicated. And you have to know a whole bunch of stuff about kind of the technical side of what's going on to be able to untangle what's happening. But yeah, Eddington was a late stage person because really by the beginning of the 20th century, people had sort of said, we know the second law is true. Actually, I'll tell you a story about, about the second law and, and proving the second law. So, you know, Einstein, you mentioned 1915, uh, general relativity. 1905 was Einstein's kind of miracle year where he introduced, you know, photons and he introduced uh, kind of Brownian motion that proved molecules existed uh, and relativity. Okay, so big, big year. Okay, so I was studying the second law and I was interested in who had worked on trying to prove the second law. Well, it turns out one name I didn't know was going to be on there is Albert Einstein. So in 1902, 1903, 1904, he wrote three papers. They were all on the second law and they all purported to be essentially proofs of the second law and they were all wrong. He had actually been working on the second law right up to the time when, and he never worked on the second law again, after 1905. But what was really interesting to me was the kind of thinking that went into his attempts to prove the second law was this kind of philosophical way of thinking about science that he kind of got a little bit from Boltzmann. Boltzmann had been the person who had, who had um, uh, been um, uh, very much involved in kind of understanding the idea of molecules, understanding the, the sort of foundations of the second law, and uh, had had this very philosophical approach to, to thinking about science. And this kind of idea of thought experiments, the idea that you can figure things out just by kind of logical reasoning was a very Boltzmann type idea, which Einstein picked up on, and first of all, tried to apply it to the second law and failed. It kind of had that, that strange history, but, but um, uh, by the time of people like Eddington, it was like, yep, it's true, you know, we're sure it's true. You know, in, in textbooks, you know, when I was a kid, I, I sort of, uh, in nowadays, I would say one of my favorite things is some, some book that explains the second law. One of the mysteries of the second law is that you can kind of prove this thing called Boltzmann's H theorem that says that, oh, the entropy will increase with time. But you can take that same proof, you can reverse it, and you can say that also proves the entropy decreases with time. And so there's a well-known textbook which ends its chapter on this saying, this point is often puzzling to the student. Well, it was puzzling to everybody else as well for about a hundred years. Um, and uh, uh, we can kind of unravel how that really works. Folks, I have to be honest, I'm disappointed in you. Only 18% of you are actually subscribed or following the podcast, whether on YouTube or on audio. You guys are listening and watching, I know you're enjoying it. But if only 18% of you are subscribed or following, it's going to be hard to keep getting great guests like Stephen Wolfram. So I want you to help me help you and just hit the subscribe button. It's free. And by doing so, you really help me boost the mission of this podcast, which is to connect millions of minds around the world. We're doing a great job, but I really need your help to take this podcast to the next level in 2024. Do it now before you forget. Thanks so much. Now back to the episode with Stephen Wolf. I would like to go there. I would like to also, though, I mean, I've had many great conversations, including those with you, but, you know, encoded in the second law is a, is a notion of time. And I wonder if we could start there in the kind of most primitive essence. What, how do you conceptualize time or how, how can you define time? What is time? What is time and how does it emerge in, in, in Wolfram physics? I understand not only time, but space emerges. So talk us through what is time. 
So as far as I'm concerned, time is the inexorable progress of computation. If we think about things in the world as being governed by rules, then what happens in the course of time is those rules get applied. And that's a, that's a process, the, the sort of what the, the, the thing that changes through time is that we've applied these rules more and more and more times. And it, it's sort of an interesting thing because one had imagined when one thinks about time in mathematics, uh, usually time is a parameter in an equation. You get some formula, it says, you know, the planet will be at this position at this time. You can pick any value for that time. You just dial in the time, you say what the answer is. Well, that's kind of a, a view of time that came from sort of the mathematical way of thinking. From a computational way of thinking, it's more, you have these rules, and then you run the rules, and you run them this step, this step, this step, and you see what happens. And one of the important phenomena that I kind of first started identifying in the 1980s is this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. This question of when the computations happen, you do this step, this step, this step, is there a way to jump ahead? Is there a way to do what kind of mathematics says you can do and just dial in the value of time and say, this is what's going to happen? Or do you have to follow every step, follow this sort of irreducible computation to see what's going to happen? And the thing that was sort of a discovery of mine in the 1980s is that it's very common to have systems which are computationally irreducible, where the only way to work out what will happen in them is just to run every step and see what happens. And that's kind of the, the sense in which that, that process of running the steps, that is the passage of time. And it's sort of an interesting thing that the computational irreducibility says you can't cheat the passage of time. You can't jump ahead and say, I'm going to figure out by being a smarter computer, so to speak, what's going to happen by being a smarter brain, whatever, I can figure out what's going to happen. That doesn't work. There's this sort of irreducible process you have to go through. That's a limitation on science. In a sense, for us, feeling good about ourselves, it's a, it's a big positive because it means that sort of you have to live the time, so to speak. There's no way to just say the answer to life, the universe, everything, whatever, is 42 or whatever. You, you have to actually live through it to get to the answer. There's no kind of way to jump ahead. You can't shortcut. A, you cannot shortcut. Yeah, right. It's, a, it's an irreducible process. So for me, kind of time is this computational process of the, the sort of progression of the universe, figuring, applying these rules to see what comes next, so to speak. Genetic technologies, including gene therapy and synthetic biology, are surrounded by ethical, social, and safety concerns. However, despite being controversial, they offer promising opportunities to revolutionize medicine, improve personalized treatment, and tackle various challenges of human life. So it's essential to stay up to date with the latest developments in this exciting field. For instance, recently the FDA approved the very first treatment to use the gene editing tool known as CRISPR, but the media landscape surrounding these developments is often fragmented, making it hard to find reliable information and find a balanced view, which is personally why I love ground news so much. I even deleted the iPhone news app that's default on my phone and replaced it with ground News's widget app. And I also bought it for a present for my older brother, Kevin. Ground news is an app and a website that gathers together all the world's media into one place so readers can compare coverage and see the full picture of what's being reported worldwide. For every story, you get a quick visual breakdown of the news outlets reporting it, including their political bias, how factual the source is, which entity owns the source, and which countries are actually reporting and covering the story. For example, let's return to the FDA's approval for the first CRISPR treatment. Right away, you can see that 162 news outlets have reported on the story. Of these 162 outlets, 23% lean left, 11% lean right, and an overwhelming 66% come from the center. You can even see who owns the outlets reporting on the story. 63% are media conglomerates. Ground News also makes it easy to compare the headlines to see how the bias might shape and influence the framing of the story and affect our understanding of it. One of my favorite features of Ground News is the blind spot feed, which allows you to see stories that are underreported by either side of the political spectrum. Ground News lets you get a deeper understanding of the complexity and nuance of different issues by identifying media narratives and their biases. You can see every side of the story and thus develop a well-rounded worldview, which is pretty substantial in these turbulent times. 
you get access to newspapers and things that are very hard to find. Go to ground.news slash Dr. Brian to stay fully informed on breaking news and compare media coverage. Sign up or subscribe through my link for 30% off unlimited access if you support the mission and find it as essential as I do to scientific literacy. Can computation occur at zero temperature? Oh, it has nothing to do with temperature. I mean, temperature is, a, is an overlay far above that, that kind of issue. So computation is, is just the following of rules that you specify, they might be rules that you could specify for, you know, a line of black and white cells. We can talk about temperature. Let's talk about temperature for a minute. It's a very different kind of thing. So, you know, actually, it's a very interesting story because in the, in the early 1800s, people knew about heat. They knew heat flowed from hotter bodies to colder bodies and things like this. And they said, what is heat? They said, well, heat must be uh, the... You know, it must be like a fluid. The only thing we know that flows is a fluid, like water. So they called it caloric. Caloric fluid was what was the embodiment of heat and flowed from sort of a hotter body to a colder body. And temperature was a sort of characterization of amounts of, uh, was related to sort of this characterization of how much heat was there there, more or less. Well, so this theory of what heat was turned out to be completely wrong. Because what is heat? Heat is the randomized motion of molecules. Heat is a feature of the microscopic structure of matter. If, if matter wasn't made of molecules, there wouldn't be heat in the same sense. And so the concept of temperature is a feature of, of a characterization of sort of the amount of randomness in these molecules. It's, it's, it's really the, you know, it's, it's just the average energy, the average energy of motion, the average kinetic energy of molecules is just, that's what defines temperature is this average kinetic energy of molecules. That level of description of talking about molecules and moving around and so on, the second law is vastly more general than that. The second law is, a, is essentially a computational statement of the fact that systems that start simple to describe will typically become complicated to describe. It's kind of like encryption. You're saying you start with that, that simple uh, initial seed and then you run this thing and you get something which for all practical purposes looks random. That's what's happening in these systems. It doesn't have to do with molecules running around. It doesn't have to do with the specifics of temperature and so on. It really is a, is a, very, a very basic computational phenomenon that actually is a consequence of this phenomenon of computational irreducibility. I do want to say one thing about temperature and, and heat and so on, which is something you know close perhaps to your interests. So one of the questions is in... Uh, Oh, actually, I should say more about, about our theory, but I want, I want to make sure to come back to this question of caloric fluid because I have a, I'm going to give you an aphorism, okay? My, my aphorism is, is dark matter is the caloric of our times.